We are on session number three of The Coming Shaking. If you have your Bibles today, I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verses 12 and 13. Now, we we have dealt with a lot of things. We have dealt with the great cloud of witness, those that are, that are members of God's great hall of faith. And they are an example for us so that when I have found, at least in my own life here in the last couple of weeks, just go once a week or even once a day and read Hebrews chapter 11 every day for a week or two, it'll change your attitude. It'll change how you see trials. It will cause faith to rise up on the inside of you. And if there was ever a time in this generation that we needed to have faith, it's right now. And then the writer of Hebrews says, not only have we this great cloud of witness that causes us to lay aside every weight that so easily besets us, he also says, now listen, sometimes there's persecution and sometimes there is chastisement of the Lord. And how many know that if God loves you, he's going to correct you? And so with all that in place, we get to verses 12 and 13, and this is the job of the Christian community, wherefore lift up the hands that which hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned away out of the way, and let it rather be healed. Now, what's interesting is when the writer of Hebrews says in this, let uh, to lift up the hands that hang down. And to strengthen the feeble knees, he's actually quoting Isaiah. And this is found in Isaiah 35, verses 3 through 4. I'll give you a minute here to define this because we actually sang part of that this morning when uh, I asked Brother Michael to, uh, to insert a song after that prophetic word that we have this morning. It says, Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees say to them that are of a fearful heart be strong fear not behold your God will come with vengeance even God with a recompense he will come and save you you see a lot of times when God shows up on the scene and isn't that what we're really wanting and 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 this is some of the things that we're dealing with when the coming shaken almighty God cannot come that it doesn't shake things up Come on now. We want revival, but we don't want the riot against the devil that comes with it sometimes. We want want that feel-good revival, but we don't want the correction of the Lord to have sustained revival and to walk in his power. But listen, it's, it's a package deal. And sometimes God allows situations to happen in our life so that we look up and say, something's wrong. Have you ever been there? that no matter what you do, it's falling apart, and and it's like, okay, I'm waking up now. I'm realizing somewhere I have wandered off the path of walking with God, and God's allowing these circumstances to come in to shake me and to wake me because I'm realizing that I have gotten off course. And that's because he loves us, and it says, listen, when these things happen or when persecution happens, Christianity is one of the most interesting faiths in the world And that historically, and we can find this both in Judaism and we can find this in Christianity, we thrive under persecution. We thrive. You see, that's that's something I think the enemy thinks in this generation. He has us so weak that he thinks that we're not going to thrive, we're going to buckle under. But let me tell you something, the remnant, those that really know God, that really have a salvation experience, when they come under persecution, they rise up to the situation. They will not yield. You can turn a Pee Wee Herman that believes in Jesus and put the persecution on him, and if the devil's not careful, he'll end up being a Marine in the kingdom of God. The church under Roman persecution, while their leaders were being crucified, the pagan world said, is this not the ones that have turned the world upside down? And right now, the way the word's being preached and the things that are going on in the body of Christ, we couldn't turn a chair upside down, much less the world. And that's one of the reasons why God is letting some of the things happen. It is judgment on us because we have been asleep and we, we have allowed this displacement that sin has replaced righteousness, that, that wickedness has replaced holiness. But when we wake up and we begin rising up in who we are, 
God says, there's some shaking going on. There's going to be a transition. So when those things happen, when the persecution comes, God says, now it is time to, to understand the correction of the Lord. One of the reasons that ISIS is growing the way that it is is Christianity has ceased being the leading influence in the earth. We have allowed the mystery religions to do their work, to weaken us, to pollute our airways, and to pollute our testimony. And it's time to come back to a holy faith, to a true faith to the Word of God. And it's time to push them back for a while because I don't think it's quite time yet. That's what that prophetic word was about. They think they have it already. And I, I, don't you just love God? The elite think they have everything in place, and then he delays their plans. He does it for two reasons. Number one, he does it for our sake especially if we're not ready yet. We're still trying to wake people up. We're still trying to get people to understand their Hebraic heritage, and I'm really getting tired of Christians fighting for pagan things. I mean, now it's we got Christians fighting for Rudolph and for Santa Claus and for Frosty the Snowman. How off have we gotten? Last time I checked, none of them are in the Word. Why are we fighting for things that we can't even validate by the Word of God? We're, we're validating mystery religion things and, and saying that we're defending the faith. No, you're not. You're defending their faith. Come back to the true Word of God. And God is allowing these things to happen to shake us and to wake us. And as, as in that shaking and waking, we're supposed to strengthen the hands that are let down. Why? Because they're supposed to be lifted up in praise. I have found the tougher things get, the more you praise, the harder it gets on the devil. And to strengthen people needs. But look what it says here. Make straight paths for your feet. Now, that is, that is basically a biblical terminology for returning to the path of righteousness. That a smooth path, a straight path that does not cause you to be tripped up is walking in God's commandments, walking in God's ways, walking back biblically once again, not with how the world tells you to interpret this book, because the world will pervert this book. The mystery religions hate this book. But when you return back to this book, even those that are weak need can walk in righteousness if we'll strengthen them just a little bit. Walking the ways of God are easy, but sometimes they're hard when the whole world's walking the other way. If the Spirit of God's on the inside of you, your spirit man wants to do this. Your head has to be convinced not to. I'm a kind of, the last couple of weeks I, I've even been dealing with, we, we've been dealing with uh, repair, rebuild, and expand, and a lot of the repairing is getting rid of what's in your head because your head is in conflict of what's in your spirit. And the devil loves to use mind games to cripple you spiritually. And you have this dichotomy going on that all the lies that you received in your mind are at odds with the truth that of, the, that's of the Word of God that's in your spirit. It's time to renew your mind so that conflict stops because we need, we need to quit self-sabotaging and we, we need to quit making our minds say things in the Word of God that it wants rather than what the Word of God plainly says. It's time that those mind games stop. Now, let's, let's go on. Now, what's interesting here is to make straight paths, because we're going to find some things here in a minute. The, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews, and what's interesting to me is that there is a movement within the, within the Hebraic roots movement to explain away the book of Hebrews. How silly can you get? The more I get into the book of Hebrews, the how more appropriate it is for today. The writer of Hebrews keeps on stressing its holiness. Once you are a believer, you walk in holiness. You walk in righteousness. You walk in who you really are in Christ. You don't turn to the right or the left of it. We understand the priesthood of Jesus, and we enter into our priesthood. We enter into this covenant that has better promises. And because of that, it's supposed to enable us to walk in righteousness and holiness more than before Jesus came. Not less, but more. When I was reading this and, and thinking about coming uh, persecution, you know, this, this is saying, listen, we, we need to strengthen that, let that be healed so that we stay true. I kind of thought there, there's an old Bruce Willis movie called Tears of the Sun. 
and there's a pivotal point that you have these Navy SEALs lined up, and you have overwhelming odds coming against them. And Bruce Willis turns to his men and yells, hold the line. That's where we are right now, I think, in a lot of things in the body of Christ, is God is saying, hold the line of righteousness. Hold the line of truth. Hold the line no matter what the enemy shoots at you. You hold the line. And in that movie, in, in, in cinematic splendor, it looks like they're, they're, they're getting shot to pieces and there's no hope of escape. But all of a sudden, they have aerial support of fire. Literally, fire comes down, not from heaven, but from the bottom of a jet, in a napalm-type bomb that incinerates the enemy. And how many of you have been calling for the fire of God, wanting the fire of God, because he will come and save you, that he will come with vengeance and with recompense? How many know that the enemy has some comeuppets coming on? There, 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 are, there are those that have been used by the elite that have done heinous things in the earth that when God rises, which he is in the process of doing right now, that they have, they have a recompense coming, that God is coming with vengeance on evil so that he can strengthen his remnant. So when the shaking comes, we should rejoice. Rejoice. And stay true to what he says. The word of the Lord for this season is to be strong and to fear not. Your God will come with vengeance and with recompense, and he will come and save you. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like right now. If you're true to him and you hold the line and you stay faithful, he's getting ready to turn things around. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited because I'm beginning to see God set up some things to bring vengeance, to bring recompense to his enemies and to come and bring deliverance and to remove all the things the enemy has, has stuck into my life. Then we go on to Hebrews 12 and 14. Listen to this. This, this one's crucial. You need to underline this in your Bible. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which, speaking of holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. How much is no man? Nobody. In a time in Christianity that we use, that we use grace as a means of doing away with holiness, The writer of Hebrews says, unless you have holiness because of the completed work of Christ in you, you will never see God. Sounds like just the opposite to me. I looked up this word, peace, irene in the Greek, and it means a state of national tranquility, exemption from rage and havoc of war, peace between individuals. And basically what he was saying was, listen, try to live peaceably with your neighbors. Even in a pagan world, right now we're living in a neo-pagan America. It's not our job to cause trouble all over the place. It's our job to live peaceable lives. Now, some would would try to use this as, as an excuse not to defend your own family. How many know the Torah is very succinct about protect, your requirement to provide and to protect for your own family? You know, it's like, I will live at peace with you, but you try to break into my house, you will meet the wrong end of a shotgun. And I will do it in Jesus' name because it's my right and my responsibility to protect my family. That's not what that's talking about here. But it's talking about being argumentative and and causing all kinds of trouble all all over the place. We best affect the world when we walk in the peace of God. We don't allow them to rattle us and we choose to be peaceable. Uh, I, I was, I've been reading reports on a lot of things that are going on around the world. And we, there was a time in Egypt when you had the, the moderate Islamic people fighting against the radical brotherhood, and there was war in the streets. And what you had is in between the conflicts, the Christians were giving medical assistance to the wounded. What a testimony that should have been. In fact, it has been because there have been many, many within the Islamic faith accept Jesus because of what they have seen of these peaceable Christians. Now, they will raise up to protect their own family, 
but they're not there to cause social trouble and they're to give help whenever they can see a time to do it. That's so important. Now, at the same time, this word, this word holy, with, with holiness, I looked it up in Jameson Fawcett Brown, and, and this is what they said in their commentary. This is a distinct Greek word from God's holiness in, in the Hebrews 12.10, translated here as sanctification in, in the version that they were using. But here's what it refers to. He is absolute holiness. Almighty God, absolute holiness. He is the thrice holy God. That holiness is his supreme character. Love has got to bow the knee to God's holiness. God is only once loved, but he's thrice holy. That's why God's holiness demanded the cross. He couldn't just forgive it without the shedding of his own blood. And then he goes on to say, he says, our part is to put on his absolute holiness. Well, that doesn't sound like the grace preaching today that you can just get away with anything that God's got to accept you now because of grace. The writer of Hebrews uses the specific Greek word for holiness that we, uh, that our part is to put on his holiness becoming holy as he is holy by sanctification. In times of spiritual conflict, you don't lower the requirements for holiness you raise them. Because a lack of holiness in spiritual warfare, we call it an open door. That when you have sin in your life, and sin is defined in the New Testament as the violation of God's commandments, they become open doors the enemy can use to attack your life. When I walk in holiness, I am systematically shutting all those doors and putting the blood of Jesus over those doors. And, and Almighty God says, devil, those doors you can't go through because they're under the blood. That's why as the day approaches, as the end times approach, we're not, we're not looking for ways out of holiness of what the Word of God describes as holiness. And I'm not talking about women putting their hair up in buns and not wearing makeup. All that is silly external stuff. It's the holiness of the heart and the conduct and of our minds. Going back to what God says, these are righteous acts, these are unrighteous acts. You avoid the unrighteous acts no matter how much you get in the flesh. You avoid them like the plague. You crucify the flesh and you do what God's word says regardless of how you feel. That's faith. That's holiness. Did I do it not to be acceptable to him? How many know the cross made me acceptable to him? I do it because I have, I have accepted him and the cross is enough and the price he paid is enough and now because I have been made acceptable in the beloved, I honor him by walking in holiness. So crucial. Listen to the way the Amplified translates this. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. Now, how much, more, how much more plain can you get than that? Believer, I don't care what they're preaching on Christian television, that if Jesus is really the Lord and Savior of your life, you walk in holiness. And Jack, if you're not walking in holiness, when he comes, you will not see him. I think we have gotten so far off of the biblical Jesus that if Jesus would return today, most of the body of Christ would be mad at him. Wouldn't even recognize him. That's why I call the book of Revelation the fifth gospel. That we, when you read the book of Le Revelation, it is not a revelation of the end times. It's not a revelation of what the devil's going to do. It's not a revelation of what the Antichrist is going to do. It says it plainly, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That we have departed so far from who we think he is, that we have so... Um, expanded to the place of almost mutilation, him coming as Messiah, Ben Joseph, the suffering servant, that when he comes back as, Joseph, as, as, as Messiah, Ben David, the conquering king, he comes back as Elohim, that we won't recognize him. Yet when you read the book of Revelation, and this is so awesome, I challenge you to read the book of Revelation. As he is pouring out wrath upon the earth, the bride is sitting there clapping her hands, saying everything that you're doing is awesome. It is just. It is true. You are marvelous in all your ways. 
And yet I have heard ministers of the gospel that are on TV say, the Jesus that is referred to and, re- and, and revealed to in the book of Revelation, if that is what he's like, I would never serve a God like that. Then you're not serving the Jesus of the Bible. First time I heard that, I swallowed hard, and I thought, man, I smell brimstone in your future, Jack. Why? Because you're not following Jesus. You have made a representation of Jesus that your flesh can tolerate, and you have set that up as an idol, and you are worshiping him. You are not worshiping the Jesus that walked the streets of Galilee, that walked and healed the sick. And told people when they healed them, go and sin no more. He didn't go and say, just wait a year or so, my grace will cover it, then you can go back to living the way that you were. Just go to church on Sunday and give a good offering, okay? He didn't say that. He said, go and sin no more unless something else worse comes upon you. And I wonder how many believers don't realize that by the teaching of hyper grace today, how many things worse are getting ready to come upon them because they have left the ways of God. Let's go on here with verse 15. Now we're getting ready to get into the good stuff. The good stuff, yeah, the good stuff, because it's going to open our eyes to to our understanding. Looking diligently, lest any man should fail of the grace of God. Now, I've never heard that preached, that you can fail God's grace And the writer of Hebrews is saying here, look diligently. That means to look extensively and thoroughly and very hard to to really go through with a fine-tooth comb to be a nitpicker about yourself lest you fail in grace. Now, this Greek word for fail means to fall behind, to come late or too tardy to be left behind in the race and so fail in reaching the goal, to fall short of the end, metaphor, to fail to become a partaker of. Well, I thought once you got in grace, you couldn't get out of it, but yet the book of Hebrews says that we can fall short. In a time that we're preaching hyper grace, the very doctrine of hyper grace is going to cause you to miss the mark when it comes to grace. Isn't that a paradox? That we have so extenuated and expanded the definition of grace that we have left the very biblical definition of grace and now we have set up on a, a, a altar a false grace. You know, that's very Luciferian. One of the revelations that I've come across that, that, that I, I put in my new book is that how many times did Lucifer say, I will, when he fell? He said it five times. Five's the number of grace. Lucifer created a false grace to cause himself to ascend to become equal with God. And he fell. And there is a false grace that is a Luciferian doctrine that he is embedding in the body of Christ. That in God's kind of grace doesn't take you away, does not take you into sin, but it takes you away from sin. Let's go and read this a little bit more. Looking diligently, lest any man should fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you. How many know sometimes when you go through hard times, you can go through correction or persecution, it is easy to let a root of bitterness take in because of things of the past. God is warning us here, don't let that take root. You forgive them now. That doesn't mean that you're stupid. One of the things that we have dealt here with a lot is the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. You know, if every time you come around a person, they hit you in the face, and they never say that they're wrong, they never, they never apologize for it, you can forgive them, but that doesn't mean you give them another opportunity to pop you up in the head, you know, upside the head. You don't do that. There's a difference between I can forgive them, but I'm, not, I'm never reconciled to them until, number one, they quit doing that, and they come to me and apologize. They get right with God, and they get right with me, and they quit that behavior. If you don't do that, there's no reconciliation. So although all of us have things in our, in our past that can, be, that can cause us to be bitter, 
I can forgive them, but I don't have to have fellowship with them because they're refusing to repent. They're refusing to recant. They're refusing to get right with God. I can forgive them. I just never have to be bothered with them anymore. My prayer for them is may the Lord bless them far off from me. And sometimes that blessing is more yours than theirs. Yet I've heard some of those same people say, yeah, but you've got to forgive me. I have. That doesn't mean, but you, you, won't, you have not repented. You have not changed. You have not, you have not gotten right with God in this thing. Therefore, I don't have to be reconciled to you. And there is a difference. You see, when, when we go to Jesus for forgiveness, we, we enter the conversation this way. You're right, I'm wrong. You're holy, I'm sinful. Therefore, I needed a Savior. Therefore, I repent because I'm not just seeking forgiveness, I'm seeking reconciliation. And that reconciliation comes by, you're right and I'm wrong. Without that, there can be no reconciliation. But we've got to be careful of let, if, if, if I don't forgive, isn't that part of what Jesus said with, with, with the, the pattern of prayer, forgive me as I forgive my debtors? Because if I allow that root of bitterness to take hold, it does not just affect me. Listen to hear what the, what the book of Hebrews says. Lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That bitterness, you become affected, you begin affecting others with your bitterness. Best to forgive and let Jesus carry to them the recompense if they don't repent. And I, got, I tell you what, there's a hammer getting ready to come on a lot of things. And it's for the remnant's sake that it's coming. But he doesn't stop there. Let's, let's go here a little bit further. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for a morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, and he, was had, and he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, I think it's interesting that there's two things here that the, that the Word of God puts together, fornication and profane. When you read the story of Esau, sometimes you've got to read between the lines a little bit. He did not esteem his birthright. How many know that you have a birthright once you're born again? Did you know that he was actually, he should have been what Jacob had, and he should have wrestled with God. His name should have been Israel, and that his 12 sons should have been the 12 tribes of Israel. That was his destiny. That was his birthright in Almighty God. But whenever you have a birthright, with that birthright comes responsibilities. One of the things that the rabbis teach about this was that this was, was actually Abraham's birthday when he fell, and that it was his right, it was his job to be preparing a dinner for this celebration for Abraham. And instead of doing that, he was off doing his own thing, whether it was hunting or, or, or running around with wild women, which Esau liked to do. He ended up marrying two Hittite women that were pagans that did not walk with God. He liked exotic women. And so he was a womanizer. He, he, he despised his birthright and his responsibility. And the rabbis teach that this porridge that... that uh, that Jacob had prepared was actually part of that meal that was supposed to be honoring Abraham that Esau was supposed to do. Then Esau came and demanded after his gallivant or whatever he was doing, he demanded to be fed of the very meal that he was supposed to have prepared. And I think there's a connection here because he, isn't it interesting, why did he say fornication and, and connect it to Esau? It, it, you know, it, it, it was probably has something to do with his desire for wild women. Now, the Greek word here is pronos. We get the word porn or, porn or pornography from. 
And it is defined as a man who prostitutes his body to another for lust for hire, a male prostitute, or a man who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse, a fornicator. Now, there, now in, in, in context here, there is also an equivalent in the Greek to a female that does the exact same thing. But since he's talking about Esau, the writer of Hebrews uses the male version of this word. But what we're seeing here is that today Christians are being told this is God's standard for sexual conduct. It is under the covenant of marriage, and it is between one man and one woman. That is God's definition, because it also says, he who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse. Well, the only way to have unlawful is you've got to go back to the law and find out what the law said. So the spirit of Esau and rejecting our birthright and the responsibilities for it is directly connected to we have an entire generation that are trading out their unlawful sexual desires for their birthright in the kingdom of God. And one day they may wake up and find out that they're like Esau. The Bible says the Spirit of God will not always strive with men, especially since they're saying that I am bisexual, transsexual, or whatever, or homosexual, and I am a Christian, maybe by the world's definition, but not by God's definition. And you start perverting the word to justify what you are. You may find yourself in Esau's position. Now, Esau later on woke up to the fact that he messed up. You know, and I thank every one of us, and we can see this with every character in the Word of God. There are watershed moments, whether you go on with the blessings of God or you just go on into nothingness. What would have happened if God would have came to Abraham and said, I want you to leave, I want you to leave Babylon and go into land I'm going to show you? And Abraham would have said no. What would have happened when he said, I want you to give your only son, the son of promise, Isaac, on an altar? And God said, no, or or Abraham said, no, I'm not going to do that. You gave that son to me, and I've I've been believing for my entire life for this son. I'm not going to kill him. We don't understand in covenant, that's what opened the door when he was willing to give Isaac on the altar, his only begotten son, the son of promise. It opened the door for Jesus to come and die on the cross on our behalf because that's the way covenant works. What would have happened if Abraham would have said no? God would have set him aside and found another. And we see biblical character after biblical character. David could have been the man that built the temple instead of Solomon because he desired Bathsheba and set up a situation that her husband would be killed so that he could lawfully take her after already committing adultery with her. He was a man of blood. It was not because he was a warrior like many supposed that he had, because all, all of God's people, every man had to serve whenever there was a conflict. All men were men of war. God said he was a man with blood on his hands because he set up for an innocent man to die so that he could have his wife. And that was a watershed moment for David. And after that, a lot of things in his own family and things began to go downhill. We need to take note of this because I think every one of us have this pivotal moment. It may not cost us our salvation, but it costs us our birthright. It costs us the blessing that we get to that place where God says, come on, come on, make this right decision. Crucify your flesh. Do what my word tells you to do. And when you do, there will be the greater blessing released. But we don't want that blessing because it always comes with the responsibilities. I've got to walk a tighter line. I've got to walk according to the word of God. I've got to crucify the flesh. I don't want this Christianity that I've got to crucify the flesh and actually do what the word of God says. I would rather begin explaining away the word and say that I can still walk with God and live however I want to. You may find yourself like Esau. That even after you awake, it may be too late. How I many know you can go so far that you can go past the point of no return? That's why, that, that's why I cringe at the way people preach once saved, always saved. And I've heard preachers get up and say, you know, I'm saved, but I go out here and commit murder and, and commit adultery and everything else, and I'm still going to heaven. Jack, you may find you're not because by doing those things, you have proven that you have not come under grace. Come on. 
someone in grace doesn't follow that path. You fell short of the grace of God. The grace of God empowers you never to do those things. You crucify the flesh. I think this warning is clear with the coming shaking that's coming, that as we enter into the last days, that we do not take our faith lightly. Everything going on in America today is challenging your faith, is challenging the publicity of, of Christianity. God is calling us to be faithful, to seek peace, to walk firmly in holiness, and to stay faithful to the one who gave his life to save our souls. That's where we are, guys. We need to determine the just shall live by faith. And the Hebraic concept of that is I will live by my faithfulness to the covenant. That's our decree. That, that's, and guys, if, if I went to the next part of it, we'd be here for another hour. So I'm gonna, we're going to put a pin in this right here, and then next week we're going to get into the shaking. We're going to get into the difference of coming between coming to Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And you want to know the truth? When you really understand Mount Zion, Mount Zion is more terrifying than Mount Sinai. We think we can just skip and, 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 and go through the daisies when we come to Mount Zion. With Mount Zion, there's a bigger birthright. Therefore, there's more responsibility. And God, let us never fall short. I pray for everyone who listens to this. God, I ask that you would give us an anointing that we would never fail the grace that's been given to us. But, Father, we would thrive in that grace. And by thriving in that grace, we walk in, in true biblical holiness to honor the God who is thrice holy that came to save us. In Jesus' name.